Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. I got a question for you. Have you ever made a deal with God? God, if you'll do this, I promise I'll do this. Yeah? How many of y'all kept that deal? I'm just kidding. I want to ask you to follow up here. So I was thinking about this this week because we're going to be talking about a story, a scene in the life of Jacob where he made a deal with God. And uh, just perfect timing, I got a letter in the mail this week. It's from the publisher of my first book. And they sent me a check for a whopping, y'all ready for this? $156. So it got me thinking about when I first got that book contract. So a lot of people think that authors just must make loads of money, right? Wrong. I make about a buck a copy on a book, okay? So, and, and then, yeah, anyways, don't quit your day job. So <laughs> I got this check, and it got me thinking about the days when I got that contract. And when you, when you sign a book contract, they send you what's called an advance. They basically send you some money in exchange for your book right now, believing they're going to make some money off of it. But they send you the money in advance, hoping that your books will sell more than they've sent you, Right. And I remember when we got that advance, it wasn't a large advance. It was like $2,000, right? It was my first book. Nobody knew who I was. And I remember when we got that check, sitting in a church service one day, and I was like, you know what, Lord, if you'll bless this book, I'll give this whole $2,000 to you into the church. So I wrote the check, and I gave my whole advance to the church. And I was thinking, oh, it's about to get good. I have given so much to the Lord. He is going to bless this book. And I started looking at the totals on this. We still haven't made that money back. But here's what I've realized about all of us. Every one of us in here, at some point in our life, we make a deal with God. Maybe you're right now trying to make a deal with God. Like, God. If you will just free me from this horrible feeling, man, I'll make sure I'm in church every Sunday. God, if you'll heal me from this cancer, from this diagnosis, God, I promise I will serve you. Man, I'll quit my job and I'll go into ministry. God, if you'll just bail me out of this situation with my son or bring my son back home, Lord, I promise our family will be in church every Sunday. Maybe this morning you've got just something weighing heavy on you and you're just saying, God, I'm just begging you to take this from me. And if you do, man, I'll, I promise I'll start tithing. But first, I need you to come through here. Everybody got real quiet in here. Yeah. We all do it. Yeah. I've done it. And the longer I live, the more I realize you don't get to make deals with God. Yeah. And when he does come, and make an agreement with you. It's a covenant, not a contract. Now, here's the difference between a covenant and a contract, okay? A contract says, you do your deal, I'll do mine. You don't do your deal, I don't got to do mine, right? Covenant's very different than that. Covenant says, hey, we're coming together, and even if you don't fulfill your part, I'm doing my part. And you know the beautiful thing about God? He doesn't make contracts. He makes covenants. And he says, all right, let's link up here. You come to me, humble yourself before me. But just know this, even if you're not faithful, I will be. Because how many times have we made a deal with God and then we didn't follow through? God did heal you. And now you're watching online. I'm just kidding if you're you're watching it all. I mean, how often do we do that? So we're going to look at the story in the life of Jacob where Jacob made a deal with God. And we're going to look at how it worked out for him. And we're going to see what we can learn about our tendency to make deals with God and what we really need to be doing in order to find the freedom and the life that God has for you. Because make no mistake, what God wants for you, the plan he has for your life is better than anything you can come up with. And some of you are here this morning because you've been living off of your own plans. And the reason you dragged yourself in here this morning is because you go, this ain't working anymore. I just can't do this anymore. So maybe your deal with God was, man, God, I'm going to start coming to church, but you got to fix the situation. So Jacob, we've been looking at his life, right? Jacob was kind of a goober, kind of a deceiver. He had some issues, right? 
And last time, the last Pastor Master Marcus message last week, Jacob's lentils, we looked at how he ripped off his brother for a blessing from his dad. Jacob was all about the blessing. We'll see in this passage. He's always like, I need, I need to be blessed. Don't we all want that? Lord, bless me. Bless me, Lord. Bless me, Lord. So Jacob, he's stolen his brother's birthright, okay? And his mom's like, son, two things. First of all, you need a wife. And second of all, we got to get you out of here because it's getting tense around here. You ripped off your brother. You need to bail. So go back to where I'm from and go find somebody to marry because I don't want you to marry somebody from around here. Some of y'all saying that right now are like, I'm going to send my son back to where I came from. I don't want to marry anybody around here, right? So it says, Jacob left Beersheba, where he was living, and he set out for Haran. Now, if you remember, Haran is where Abraham came from. So his great-grandfather came from there. Or actually, it was his, 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 his grandfather came from there. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. So, you know, they're, he's just walking along. He decides to camp out that night. And taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. And he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to the heaven. And the angel of the God were ascending and descending on it. Now, you may have heard of this as Jacob's ladder, right? Some, some translations say a ladder. Some say it's a stairway to heaven. Right? Led Zeppelin said that. So there are above it, there above it stood the Lord. So he sees this, he's sleeping and he sees this ladder. And there's angels going up and down this ladder or stairway. And up at the top, way off in the distance is God. And God speaks down to him and says this, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac, your dad. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. I'm making a deal with you here. Actually, I'm making a covenant with you. He says, your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. There's going to be a whole lot of them. And you will spread out to the west and to the east. You're going to go all over this land, to the north and to the south. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you and through your offspring. And I'm with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. It's quite a promise. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, whoa, surely the Lord is in this place. And I wasn't aware of it. You ever had one of those moments, maybe it happened in church or you were in the outdoors or something. All of a sudden you just have this great awareness of God. It's like your eyes are open. You're like, oh, whoa, God is real. He's here. He's like with me. That's what happens. He was afraid and he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called that place Bethel. He renamed the place, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow. God, if you'll be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord, then you can be my God. If you take care of me, you can be my God, you lucky God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. I'll even start tithing, Lord, if you take care of me. This happened like 5,000 years ago. Has humanity changed much? We all have a moment where we have an experience with God. That's why you're here this morning. Like, man, God shows up in a real way. Maybe he healed somebody and you're like, oh, wow, he's real. Maybe you were in the bottom of your, hit the rock bottom in your addiction and you felt this presence around you and God like carried you through it and now you're on the other side of addiction. We all have this moment where we have this powerful experience with God and God comes to us, but oftentimes he feels pretty far off. It's like that ladder. It's like a stairway. And we're like, man, we hear the voice of God and we're like, whoa, this is real. God's real. And then we, the crazy thing is God says, hey, I'm going to be with you. And then, but then we start making deals with him. Even though he's already said he's going to be with us, we go, okay, but let me, let me do my thing. And then you come and bless my thing. Cool. Is that cool, God? We all tend to do it. Well, Jacob goes. And God does bless him. But the crazy thing about the story, I'm going to condense the whole story. It's several chapters of the Bible. Jacob goes, actually, I think he went to Arkansas because he ended up marrying a cousin. <laughs> but he gets, you know, remember Jacob was a deceiver. Well, he meets his match in his uncle. His uncle starts playing him like a fiddle. He says, hey, man, he's like, hey, I want to marry my cousin, Rachel. And he's like, sweet, you can marry her. 
All you got to do is work for me seven years. So he, he ends up supposedly marrying Rachel. He must have been very drunk because the next morning he woke up and realized he had actually married Rachel's sister, Leah. He's like, wait a second, you ripped me off. Remember, remember who was the deceiver here in this story? It was Jacob. Well, the deceiver got deceived. He got played. Anyways, long story short, ends up marrying two of his cousins and ends up committed to 14 years of labor, working for his uncle. Well, during that time, his uncle does some shady tricks, right? So like they'll say, you take these sheep over here and the ones that are spotted, you can, I'll, I'll, uh, you can keep the ones that are spotted. And so then Jacob would like, his, his father-in-law would take those sheep and actually like pull them out of the flock before they counted. And so he'd rip, basically he's ripping off Jacob. So it's crazy because, but God kept blessing Jacob right in the middle of this. So you see Jacob for like, it's like over 14 years. You see that Jacob, God is blessing him like God promised he would do. But at the same time, Jacob is really having to work under a really hard uncle boss guy. And then finally he gets to a point where he's like, I can't take this anymore. The deceiver has been out deceived so many times. He's like, I can't take this anymore. I got to get out of here. And we all come to a point in our life where yes, we're serving the Lord. And yes, he may even be blessing you. But we come to a point where we go, I can't do this anymore. So he's like, I'm going back home. So he packs up his family and starts to go home. Doesn't tell his uncle. His uncle tracks him down. He's like, what are you doing? So he's like, works out the, works out the issue with his uncle. But then he's on his way out and he, rip, he finds out that his brother, the one he ripped off, is coming out to meet him. So like all of a sudden, everything, it's all, it's time to pay the piper for a lifetime of bad decisions all at once. And Jacob is freaking out. He's freaking out. He doesn't know what Esau is going to do. Remember, Esau was this manly warrior. Pastor Mark just talked about that. Like, he was a manly man. He's like, man, is, is he going to come and, like, slit my throat for taking his birthright? What's going to happen? So he's kind of freaking out. He's really worried. And he goes, starts to head back, and he has this other encounter with God. And this is where I think it starts to really reveal some things about human nature. Jacob was left alone. The goober sent his family ahead of him. Just, you don't do that, right? The man should be out front. But he sends his family ahead of him as to kind of buffer him from his brother who's coming to get him. And a man wrestled with Jacob till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. This is where we get Jacob and the limp. Then the man said, let me go for it's daybreak. But Jacob in classic style, what is Jacob always looking for? Bless me. Bless me. He says, I won't let you go until you bless me. The man said, what's your name? He goes, my name's Jacob, remember, which means deceiver. So he's essentially saying, my name is the deceiver. Then the man he was wrestling with, who FYI is God himself, says, your name will no longer be deceiver, but Israel, which means wrestles with God. Because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. I think this story is fascinating because I think it shows the picture of kind of the ladder we're all climbing in our walk with God. We have this moment where we have an encounter and we see God up there and we basically say, God, you're up there. Bless my plans down here. And you start living and doing your thing and you keep bumping up against the walls and you've got your plans and then they get thwarted and we start going, God, what's the deal? Why didn't you come through like I'm supposed to? And we all come to a point where we eventually get to this place where we, we have to wrestle with God. And he comes really close. He doesn't feel far off anymore. He comes really close. And we're going, God, why didn't you bail me out? Why didn't you heal her? Why didn't you save the marriage? Why didn't you save the business? Why wouldn't you take away this heavy weight of sadness or grief or depression I'm carrying? I've been praying. I even made a deal with you. I said I'd do something if you did it, and you didn't do it, so I don't have to do my thing. And we get mad at God. Or sometimes we just get numb. And we keep showing up to church, but we're numb. You've been disappointed by God. You go, well, can, can I don't know, you know, some religious, spiritual people were like, how dare you say you're disappointed with God? You, God doesn't owe you anything. Hey, I completely agree. But the fact is, you're disappointed. So what are you going to do with it? And we all come to this place where we've been trying to make the world conform to what we want. We've been renaming places. I'm going to call this place Bethel because I'm so awesome. 
It was a powerful experience for me. So you rename it. But, but there comes a point where God says, all right, you don't get to name things anymore. Let's really dive into this because maturity means I get to name the terms. And when you come to surrender to the fact that he gets to name the terms, that is when you all of a sudden start to realize the true identity of who God made you to be. And that's where he says, hey, what was your name? Let me give you this new name. There's a verse that says he gives us a new name. And I heard a preacher say one time, he says, he gives us a new name and he doesn't tell anybody what the name is. Only he knows it. I was like, why would he not tell anybody the name? He says, well, because the enemy is called the accuser of the brethren. And sometimes the enemy will come up and be like, hey, look what Joel's up to down there. And God will say, I don't know who Joel is. He died at the cross. That's my boy down there. And I ain't going to tell you his name because then you'll be accusing him. He gives you a new name. But to get to that place, we often have to wrestle with God and come to the realization that we aren't in quite as much control as we think we are. And God is going to bless you, but it's not because you made some deal with him. It's because you've surrendered your life to him. Yeah. There's, this, there's this book I read a few years back. I met the author, and she's an amazing lady. She basically said that this, the life of faith can be broken down into six stages. Now, I believe, now listen, this isn't some sort of a marker point to see where you are in your growth of faith or whatever, but she says this is kind of the way your faith unfolds in relationship to God. It all starts with a recognition of God. This is where we have the epiphany experience. God shows up on the ladder and we're like, oh, God is real. Some of you have just realized this. God is real and he has a plan for your life and you're just blown away by this. And it's a, I'm so glad you came to realize this. It's super important to realize God made you for a purpose. You were his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And the struggle we face, the wrestling we face with God here is, God, but, but God, all the bad stuff I did, how could you love me? I'm unworthy. And the wrestling with God we have to do in that stage is recognizing you aren't worthy, but Jesus made you worthy. So you've got to take on your new name and realize, regardless of what you did in the past, it's not what you did or didn't do that's getting you into the kingdom. It's what Jesus did that's getting you into the kingdom. And you start from that foundation of, holy cow, God loves me. And it's not because I'm such a great person or so smart or so smooth. He just loves me. And that's the first wrestling we have with God. Then we come to this, what's called the life of discipleship. And this is where we wrestle with realizing that God's way is not our way. And you get in line and you start to realize, wow, God has this order that he put in the universe and these principles that if you work with these principles, you actually can live this abundant life he promises because when you work according to the principles, we talked about in the last series, Build It, we talked about the fact that when you get in line with the way God made the world and the principles he put in the world, you get blessed. And it's not because you're so smart. It's just because you got in line with the way he made the world. The life of discipleship is the next stage. And some of you right now, you're in the, you've been in the recognition of God phase, and now it's time for you to lock in. And you need to be in this church every time the doors are open. You need to get involved in a small group because you need to start reframing your mind. Right now, your mind has been messed up and corrupted by the world, but you need to be not conformed anymore to the pattern of this world, but you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the way you do that is by soaking in it. And it's not going to happen coming and listen to a 30-minute sermon every Sunday. You're going to have to get in the Bible yourself. You're going to have to get in a small group. You're going to have to latch on to somebody who's been walking in the faith for a long time and say, teach me, what do I not know? Yes. And you lock in. Then there comes a phase where you got to stop. Like you keep, life, this never goes away, right? Life will just these, All these things build on each other. So you transcend one stage, but you include it, right? So you build on it. Doesn't mean you don't need life of discipleship. I constantly have to stay in my Bible. I have to constantly stay in accountability. But there comes a point where all of a sudden you realize, I need to do something with this stuff God has put in me. But a lot of times we feel like, but I, I'm not qualified to do anything. And again, we recognize we aren't qualified, but he qualifies us. And some of you right now, you've been sitting here and you know so much Bible. I was, at a, I was teaching at a men's conference recently and I talked to this one guy. Man, he knew so much Bible. He was a big, fat, bloated Bible guy. And I'm not talking physically, I'm talking spiritually. And he was sitting around condemning all these people for how they were doing. Said, well, they're not doing church right over there. The Bible says this. And I'm like, have you ever tried to do church? <laughs> no. But I know how it should be run. I just haven't found a place that's run the way it should be. I'm like, then start your own friggin' church. Like, at some point, you've got to stop sitting on your theology, and you've got to go out and start doing something. Yeah. That's the productive life, Right? Then we come to this place where we all of a sudden, we've been serving, we've got a lot of Bible in us, we know things, and we come to this place where we go, why can't I get over these hangups? 
why do I still have this addiction? Why do I still feel obsessed with looking at pornography or drinking alcohol or whatever it is? And you're like, I can't get over this. And all of a sudden we start to realize there's some deep stuff. A few weeks ago, we talked about the soul, the three parts we're made of. There's some deep stuff in your soul that you're like, what's going on inside of me? Because I still don't quite feel the abundant life that Jesus promised. And some of you, maybe you're at that stage right now. You're like, man, there's some dark parts of me. Why, why hasn't God taken it away? I've been at church every Sunday. I've been reading my Bible. Why won't he take these dark parts of me away? And that's when we start to go a little bit deeper into this journey inward, and we start to get into some soul healing. And then comes this phase called the wall. John of the Cross, he called this the dark night of the soul. And this is the moment where all of a sudden you realize God is not who you thought he was. And he doesn't do what you think he should do. And he isn't your genie who answers on command. And all of a sudden, your faith starts to get shaken. Now, you've been in this for a long time. It's like, the, you know, the Peter at one point, Jesus started talking about, he's like, if you want to follow me, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And people are like, is he talking cannibalism? And they start bailing. They start leaving. And Jesus looks at Peter. and He's like, hey, are you going to leave too? And Peter essentially says, I, I kind of would like to, but I'm all in on this thing. Where else will I go? You've got the words of life. And we come to a phase where we start looking at things and we go, man, and you even start to wonder if you've lost your faith. All the things you used to believe about God, like he was your genie, you all of a sudden start to go, did, did I not even understand this faith? Like, I feel like I, I don't. And, and what, what we want to do is sometimes we want to run back to a simpler stage. You know, back here, God said it, I believe it, and that's enough. But you have all these doubts and you start questioning and people here, it's going to be a dangerous area because a lot of people just go, I want to throw everything out. But if you can push through this wall, uh, listen, I'm, I've been through this in the last three years, so I can relate to this wall, okay? God has just completely not done anything I wanted him to do. <laughs> and I've gotten mad. I'm like, God, have you abandoned me? It's like that, that coat that you pull out every winter and you forgot it was in the closet and you're like, oh yeah, that coat, that's a great coat I've got here. But you only have to use it like one day of the year here in, in Texas. Then you pull it out, you're like, this is a nice coat, right? Sometimes I feel like that in God's closet. He's like, oh, Joel, flips on like, oh, Joel, I forgot you're back there, bro. Bro, I got great plans for you. I just completely forgot you were back there. You ever felt that way? Like, God, I'm here, man. I want you to use me, but you forgot me. That's the wall. Then we come to this place where we all of a sudden start to realize God's not my genie. I don't get to call him on command and name it, claim it. But really, you know what? None of this is really about me anyways. A guy named A.W. Tozer, he said, the essence of surrender is getting out of God's way so that he can do through you what he wants to do in you. It's really all about, are you going to let God's work flow through you and transform you so that you can be a light to those around you and be a blessing? And that's where you get your mission, and that's where you get your message, and that's where you get your purpose. The thing he's uniquely placed you on earth to do, but it often comes after a wrestling with God. When you all of a sudden are completely disappointed, and maybe it comes after he has to break your hip a little bit so you yeah. walk with a limp. Yeah. And you go, oh, yeah. man, this is going to be on my permanent record. This, you know, the divorce, the moral failure, whatever it was, and you're like, I don't know if God could use me ever again. And God's like, no, actually, now you're ready to be used because you stopped trying to do it on your own strength. Now you're walking around with a limp, and he's like, ha, now I can use you because you're going to stop trying to do it all on your own. You're going to stop trying to use me as a genie. Now I can actually work through you. And then we come to this place where we call life of love. And here's Mike, what I'm convinced of. You may get here, but you're going to start right over again. It's an ongoing circle where all of a sudden you're like, oh, I learned a whole new thing about God. I've been hanging out in the church for 44, 45 years. I'm 44, but I was born in the church, so nine months in my mom's belly, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm in a stage right now where I'm going, whoa. I'm just a transformation of my faith. And I'm following God. I think it's for the right reasons for the first time in my life. And it's not because of anything he can give me. It's not because he's going to double my money when I give him my money. <laughs> and there comes a point where Carl Jung, he said this, one cannot live the afternoon of life according to the program of life's morning. Life happens in seasons. And, and here's the cool thing about God. Let me finish the quote. For what was great in the morning will be of little importance in the evening. 
The stuff you value when you first come to Christ probably won't be the stuff that's important later on in your walk, but that's okay because everything builds on itself. And what in the morning was true with the evening will become a lie. And what you find oftentimes is, you know, here's the cool thing about it. If you're new to this faith, man, I kind of wish I was there again because you're in a really special place. God's going to do some stuff for you that's going to blow your mind right now. If you ask, I guarantee you, you'll receive, man. That parking spot at the mall. <laughs> Lord, give me a closed parking spot at the gym. Like, why do you need a closed parking spot at the gym? But anyway, <laughs> and he does. And you start seeing him do miracles. And I thank God, just because he's cool like that, he will often play genie for you early on. So milk that. If you're new to the faith, start milking that, okay? Right? Because God's that way. He's just good at that. He loves to do that because he just loves us. But as you're maturing, he's, he starts to go, hey, um, I need you to start following me for different reasons now. So I'm not going to be playing genie anymore for you. In fact, I might get a little bit quiet because, you know, when a teacher is giving you a test, they sit in the corner and don't feed you the answers. They trust you've internalized the material. And if you're like, I need an answer, then you take the test. And God might be really quiet for you right now. If he is, welcome to the club. I'm right there. When he does talk to me, it's stuff I don't want to hear. (laughs) When I do need answers, he he seems really quiet. But if you're there, know this. You're right on track. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. He hasn't forgotten you. But here's what I've realized about all these stages. And what I think Jacob realized is this. You can fight and you can wrestle with God all along. But but what what if you did this? What if you surrendered now? and willingly embraced God's way for you because the path to each new level that he wants to take you on doesn't come through the victory like we think victory does. Where we get God to do what he want us to, we want him to. Victory in the faith comes when we surrender and say, God, not my will, yours done. And Jesus showed that for us, didn't he? He said, man, if there's any other way to do this crucifixion thing, me dying for the sins of the world, please, uh, let's do it. But if there is no other way, not my will, but yours be done. And victory in this walk of faith comes with surrender. And how often do we fight trying to get God to do what we want him to do? We make deals with him and God's like, it doesn't work that way. So here's my encouragement to you this morning. What do you need to surrender? What is it you've just been holding so tight to? And you're like, God, I promise I'll do this if you'll do that. And he's like, and he might do it. Don't get me wrong. He's cool like that. Sometimes he will. But if he's not answering the way you want him to, know this. There's a good chance he's saying, all right, buddy, it's time for you to go to the next level. And what that's going to require is you surrender. Let it go. Corey Ten Boom said, hold everything in your hands lightly. Otherwise, it hurts when God has to rip it out. Because he's going to stop at nothing to get you where he wants you to go. He knows the plans he has for you. They're good plans. And all the stuff you're holding on, C.S. Lewis says this, God's calling us to this great adventure, this holiday at the sea, but we're content to play in our sandbox at home. We're like, don't take me from the sandbox, Mom. I want to play in the sandbox. We're like, I'm taking you to the ocean, kid. But Dad, the sandbox. And how often do we want to keep playing in our little sandbox and God is promising us a holiday at the sea? So that's my encouragement for you guys today. Know this. God is in this process of making who, you who he wants you to be. And right now, he may, you may be new to the faith and he feels far off. And there's this journey. He's going to have this ladder he's going to have you climb. And every stage of it, you're going to go, whoa, this looks different up here. Like the higher you get up closer to him. And there's going to come a point where you're going to feel like you're wrestling with God. And you're wondering if you've even lost your faith. And if you're in that stage, know this. Push through. Not just push through, but push into him. Even if it means you end up trying to wrestle with God. And know this. You won't win He'll win. But when he wins, you win. You can't beat him. He's the most powerful force in the universe. But when you wrestle with him, there's something that could... I mean, isn't it true that the, the, we, we wrestle with the ones we love the most? If you love somebody, you just fight it out sometimes. Right? If you don't care about somebody, you're like, forget them. I'm leaving. But the fact that you're wrestling with this faith, that's a good sign. So what do you need to surrender this morning? We've all got something. What have you been negotiating with God? God, if you'll do this, I'll do this. What do you need to let go of and like Jacob say, uh, all right, you win. 
Think about that this morning as I pray. Lord. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.